All right, Abby Schuffs with the University of Minnesota Extension for the last 10 years. Um, poultry and uh, application of health and programs, including biosecurity, emergency preparedness, management, backyard poultry ordinances, bridging communication. This is about extension. This is about how to affect the education and the people on the farm and, and leading to these practices for biosecure entry. So, Abby. Thank you. Is my microphone okay? I can move it. All right. Is this my click? Oh, look at that. Pointer. All right. Well, thank you, Matsi, and the rest of the committee for inviting a poultry educator to talk with you uh, this morning. And again, yes, I am from Extension. And our role in Extension is to bring the research that's happening within our systems, within the universities, and bring it to our producers. And I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say, we know biosecurity is a large component of our confinement systems, swine and poultry, right? But what I wanna highlight today are two studies that have been recently completed at the University of Minnesota that are taking a little deeper dive into the actual protocols that we are encouraging our producers to use in our Danish entry systems. The first study um, was part of my PhD research and what we wanted to do was to compare the efficacy of biosecurity protocols and how they were delivered to the person actually having to go through those motions um, by evaluating the number of errors that occurred against the instructions that they were given, uh, how long it took them to do, and to see how performance was affected over a length of time. Um, I'm gonna back up a little bit. And with Adam and Tyler's presentations earlier, I really loved um, Adam's concept of the audit. Poultry needs that. We don't have that yet really in our industry. There were pieces of that audit that were what we would consider conceptual biosecurity. Where you fit within your system, where your farm is environmentally, um, do you have fields nearby? Do you have other barns nearby that are in or not in your same working system? Um, with our poultry farms, wild waterfowl are a challenge right now for highly pathogenic avian influenza. Do we have uh, waterways nearby a poultry farm? Do we have crop fields next door that once they're harvested, the geese come by and hang out for a while. Those are concepts that all need to be considered as part of biosecurity. We're not gonna say one is better or um, one is just absolutely not acceptable. It's just a matter of taking into consideration and working with those concepts for that business. The second tier of biosecurity is gonna be structure. What are your trailers looking like? What do your barns look like? Are there mice getting in your barns? Um, are they older barns? What are the structural fixed assets that you can work with? The equipment, are you sharing equipment? Are you not sharing equipment? Those fixed assets, the structure of your biosecurity. The third tier is why I have job security, excuse me. It's operational biosecurity. It's the human aspect of biosecurity. And this is the tier of biosecurity where you can fix and mitigate the liabilities that you've already identified through your conceptual or your structural biosecurity, through an audit, through training, through constructive criticism. However, this tier of biosecurity, operational biosecurity, is the most unreliable because it does rely on human behavior, right? So that's what this study was really trying to evaluate. And because I'm in extension, my job is to teach. And I wanted to really um, set out to understand, is the way we're teaching these biosecure protocols really having an effect, or is it not? We learned the answer to this, but what's more important that I'm gonna present to you are some of the observations that we were able to pull from this study. So, um, 
First, to set it up, we built three uh, mock biosecure entryways in a laboratory space at the University of Minnesota. And this is what they looked like from an aerial view. We had um, three separate spaces, and each space had its own set of assigned protocols. So protocol one was merely just to come in and sign a visitor's logbook, remove any personal outerwear, personal items, and uh, three, do something with their phone. And we gave them some options to do with their phone. These three steps were the same in all three rooms. And so those were sort of our control and our standards. Um, the, oops, sorry. The maroon arrow is the, the direction of flow in. And then, so they went into the quote unquote barn area. And then they were given three really simple tasks like putting together a 24 piece puzzle or reading a, a weather, um, gauge and like taking some data. So we were trying to maybe distract them a little bit and, and simulate work that they would be doing in the barn before they had to come back and exit the biosecure room in the opposite fashion of where they entered. Uh, okay, I'm hitting the wrong button, I'm sorry. Okay. Protocol two is where we're introducing the clean, dirty line. In the poultry industry, we're using the term line of separation. I hope you guys are starting to adopt that. But um, the line across the uh, floor is what we are calling the line of separation. This was not a physical barrier. It was just a piece of tape on the floor. Um, this little icon means we had cameras there. So I watched almost 600 videos of people walking in and out of their um, entries. And again, we have the first three steps of the protocol. Sign the visitor's logbook, remove outerwear, put them on hooks, et cetera, do something with their phone. Step four was to remove their footwear. And then step five was to step across the line of separation into barn-specific boots. Step six was hand sanitizer to simulate hand washing. And then again, they entered the barn area. Protocol three was very similar, except the line of separation was a physical barrier. It was a bench. And step six here was actually to put on a lab coat to simulate coveralls, barn specific coveralls, et cetera. And then step seven in this protocol was the hand washing step. The participants that we um, enlisted for this project were all recruited from within the University of Minnesota and were students, faculty, or um, staff. They did come from the agriculture-related departments, but they had varying experience with biosecurity. Some of them were very, very naive. Some were student workers. Some were students that worked on a farm. Some of us were really um, academically smart about biosecurity, but the act of doing it physically could have been a little bit of a challenge. Um, and they were compensated for their time. It was 10 bucks, but it got students to come, right? Um, and so the treatment variables that we used that we wanted to look at was the round. And the round being, they had an initial visit, and then they came back four to eight weeks later and visited again. That second visit, they did not get the instructions again. They were to rely on what they were taught the first visit. The protocol, like I said, there's one, those are the three rooms. They had to do all three rooms on the same single visit. And they were randomly chosen what room they started in. Some people started in room three, very overwhelming. Some people started in room one. And then from their starting room, they just worked clockwise through the other two rooms. They were given one instructional method, and it was either they had to listen to me tell them what their instructions were. They could read them to themselves silently. There was really no time limit. It was a matter of as, how much time they needed. Or they could watch an instructional video that was animated, and it was narrated, and it was, it was fun. And like I mentioned, we did have a varying level of experience. Um, and they, on a Likert-like scale of five points, the average was a two, meaning they had some experience with biosecurity at their starting point. And what we were looking for was how long did it take them to enter the room and how long did it take them to leave? 
and then how many errors did they have going in and how many errors did they have coming out. Errors for this purpose was they did something out of sequence, they had three steps or they had six steps or they had seven steps, fairly simple. Um, if they didn't do something at all, that was an error, or if they did something incorrectly, those were our errors that we were tallying. So, results. Through our really messy statistical analysis, we found that the only variable that contributed to our entry errors was the time between visits. There were one and a half more times more errors on their second visit than there was on their first visit when they entered the biosecure entryway. As re with respect to when they were leaving the farm, there were 1.2 times more errors in round two than there was in round one. The exit errors by protocol. We can assume, and you're probably right, that the more protocol steps in the protocol there is, the more opportunity and the more room for error there is, and our statistics do show that. So that um, protocol two, the six steps, definitely had more errors than those three little steps in protocol one, and then even more so, more errors occurred in protocol three than, also, than happened in protocol one. Oh, sorry. So, here are what some of the errors are. These have not been necessarily statistically analyzed. Right now, they're just um, descriptive. Um, uh, step number two was removing their outerwear. That was a frequent occurrence that they're little things. They weren't removing watches or like um, fitness trackers. They weren't removing hats and caps or layers. If they had a sweatshirt, if they had a flannel on or things like that and keys. They weren't removing keys from pockets or their lanyards, the students. Now, I will grant there were not explicit instructions given to them that, that those are the items they had to remove. The instructions was just remove your outerwear or personal items you would not wear into a barn. That was the instruction. So the practical aspect of this is if you don't want them wearing their sweatshirt into the barn, you're going to likely have to encourage and specify, do not wear outside sweatshirts, do not wear outside flannels, do not wear outside caps. You have to keep it simple and kind of stay biosecurity for dummies. You're gonna have to explain that. Not closing the doors, I thought was actually a surprising error um, because I feel like most of us would close an actual door if it was closed. Um, if you can recall back to one of those first slides and I showed you the picture of the rooms, they were like accordion doors. Um, the, the, the first door that they would go in, I would consider the exterior door to the outside. There was an 18% error rate among all three protocols, both rounds coming and going, that that door was not closed and a 23% error rate for the door of the entryway to the barn not being closed. What I also find very interesting is that most of those errors occurred in protocol three. Like, significantly, most of those errors happened in protocol three. So that leads to the question, was that a structural biosecurity problem that probably could have been fixed because those doors were harder to close, they didn't actually latch, or were they just so frustrated with the number of steps that they had to complete that they were done and they were over it and they just didn't do it? So that's something that you would wanna go back and, and try to understand and audit that process. Why was that and what can we do to mitigate that? Um, <clears throat> in protocol two, recall, I, if you recall, it's just a piece of tape on the floor for that line of separation. There was removed footwear like streetwear that was sort of creeping across that line of separation into the clean space. That was one of the errors. That did not happen when there was a bench there. I think that um, that knowledge is very common that a structural line of, bios or line of separation is more effective and this also will help quantify that. Um, and then the, the I, I expected it to be honest, is stocking feet, 
being on both the clean floor and the dirty floor at the same time. And that happened with both protocol two and with protocol three. So it still happens, even though they were told not to do it, it still happens. When I do my extension education or any of my programming, I relate doing a biosecure entry to choreographing a dance. What I'm physically capable of is going to be very different than what a 24-year-old new veterinarian can probably physically do compared to the 72-year-old farmer who's still hard at it. What, what physical abilities can we still do? And part of that personal choreography for being able to properly enter and exit a biosecure entry is making sure your feet are where they need to be at the appropriate times. So I don't want to be the naysayer, so here's what went well in all of these entries. Every person signed the visitor's logbook. Yay! Phones. There were actually no errors with the phones. But here is what I find interesting, and this is what you can maybe take back to some of your producers. And I obviously realize that most of you have different protocols potentially with your phones and expectations. Um, again, sorry, wrong button. 32% of them didn't even bring their phone in. They left it on the table when they registered with me. Maybe that's an expectation that they're already practicing on their home farms or at the university farm. I have no idea. But they just didn't even bring their phone with them um, into the study area. 35% left them on a table in the entryway, like right next to the visitor's log. So more than half left their phone in the entryway or just didn't even bring it with them. So I was pleased to see that, in all honesty. 15% of them put it in a Ziploc bag and left it in the entry. I, they weren't instructed to do that, but it was an option that they chose. And 18% of, uh, of the participants did put it in a Ziploc bag and then carry it with them on their person. 100% um, of footwear was removed. Yay, participants. And no footwear crossed the bench of the line of separation. So, I mean, there's bright spots to the biosecurity that, that's happening, and especially as we're building culture, people are understanding what this stuff means. Um, this slide is going to take into account some experience that the person has on site. So if a person was assigned protocol one as their first protocol, it took them approximately 16 more seconds than people who use protocol two as their second or their third entry. So the, the virgins that were introduced to the project, it took them longer. This is just helping to quantify the fact that the first time a new worker or a new veterinarian to your farm premises or a new service provider is coming to your farm, it is going to take them longer to go through those biosecure protocols that are your expectations, so plan for that. The same is true for, um, ugh, really, I'm gonna, I do know what I'm doing. <laughs> the same goes for protocol two and for protocol three. 30 seconds more and almost a minute more for those first time entries compared to those who have already done similar protocols. So within a protocol, protocol two took about 16, um, 17 seconds to complete. As you add more steps, you're gonna add more time. That's what that slide is explaining. I wanna make sure I have um, time left for everything. Um, notable, other notable observations are people need some form of support when removing shoes and putting on shoes. 77% 70, 77 of all entries and exits put their hand on the wall at some point to slip their feet out of their footwear, whether it was their street footwear or their barn-specific footwear. So that tells you a lot. Have something in your entries and exits, clean and dirty, that people can use to support that, and that also needs to be cleaned as part of your protocol in those spaces. And then um, in protocol three, we had lab coat wearers or coverall wearers. Um, again, it was not explicitly instructed that they had to put it on and button it fully. It was just put on the lab coat, but 63% of them did not fully button 
um, the lab coat. So again, it just goes back to explain everything, uh, biosecurity for dummies. Um, okay, so education method didn't have an effect. That's what we learned. Everybody has different learning styles, so make sure you can take that into account. Site-specific experience did have an effect on how long it took, and compliance changes over time. We know compliance is our challenge. Make sure you're constantly training, you're constantly reminding, you're auditing, and you're training. All right, so study number two was led by Matsi and her team, and it was a matter of hand hygiene. Is washing our hands okay? We've all come from the pandemic, and what did they tell us to do? Hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. That's what this study is effectively looking at. Can hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer work in place of hand washing? Should it be in combination? What, what's the uh, best protocol for the best practice here? So the objective was to evaluate hand hygiene protocols to remove influenza virus from the hands of, working, of workers after they handled infected pigs. And essentially, um, pigs were infected at the BSL laboratory with influenza and the hands of the workers were tested beforehand. I think that's the next slide. Did tested beforehand, um, and Matsi, help correct me if I'm wrong, or I need to add some minutes. They were they had human con or human contact with infected pigs for 10 minutes, and then they were swabbed again. They um, then had to go through one of those protocols, whether they were using just soap and water, if they were rinsing their hands with water only, if they used an alcohol-based sanitizer, or if they were using disposable gloves. And then those hand swabs were run on a PCR for virus isolation. And the results were pretty interesting. Hands washed with soap and water or water only had limited influenza reduction um, with differences at only some of the time points. And those can be seen by these little asterisks up here. So water only is, is really not effective. It was removing some, but it's not removing everything. Same with soap and water. There were differences at different time points, um, days post-inoculation. And then the alcohol-based sanitizers and hands with gloves had larger reductions in virus isolation, and the differences were significant at all time points. So that's just going to show you that we still need to stick with, um, sorry, not still but alcohol-based sanitizer can be effective at removing influenza virus from an infected hands and disposable gloves, then tossing them away and then testing bare hands can be an effective use. So influenza can be readily found on the hands of people handling influenza-infected pigs. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer and wearing disposable gloves are the most effective form of ha hand hygiene in this study. And soap and water should still be used um, to facilitate the removal of organic matter first. That's the basics of cleaning and disinfecting, right? Get rid of the stuff first and then disinfect. So that could, sh should and can still be a very critical component of your hand hygiene products. But hand sanitizer can then be followed up and has been shown to be very effective at minimizing influenza. Um, that's all I have. So thank you. I realize I'm okay, right so on time. All right, everybody. <laughs>